Well, I'm really happy to be here. I learned a lot this morning. And rice blast really is a persistent pathogen. I mean, the first written reports were in the 1600s. Um, breeders have been working on this for a long time in terms of trying to get resistance genes that can control the fungus. But the fungus is just extremely variable and over to, right now, able to overcome the resistance that we throw at it. So uh, you need to think about fungus now. Fungus is a eukaryote. So they're like us. In fact, fungi are good models for our metabolism and cellular processes. So fungi are, are a lot like us. Now, I'm going to, hopefully. Um, so my talk is about follow the effectors, understanding ancient and emerging blast diseases of rice and wheat. So this is rice blast. This is the, the panicle where the grain forms. And you see this dark region here is the fungus. So the, the neck of the panicle is especially susceptible to this fungus. And if it gets infected, there's 0% yield. So it's a very explosive disease. There's also leaf lesions here. Um, this is wheat blast, which is an emerging disease, only been seen since 1985 in Brazil. So it's an interesting contrast because we think rice, uh, the blast fungus probably moved to rice around 7,000 years before present, whereas wheat blast is new. So the fungus, Magnaportha arisei, causes disease on leaves, nodes, and panicles, so basically all above ground parts of the plant. It destroys enough rice each year to feed about 60 million people. Uh, the community has um, cloned, has identified over 100 resistance genes now. Um, this is probably an old number, but 25 of them, at least 25, have been cloned, and 11 have uh, have their um, cloned corresponding A virulence genes, which we'll get into a little bit more. But it's still often controlled by fungicides because the fungus is very easily, within one to two, two to three years, the fungus is able to overcome any resistance genes that the breeders put out there. Wheat blast is behaving a little different, so it's mainly on the heads. And again, if the rachis is infected, all of the head above the, the infection is dead. So you can get 0% yields. It was first discovered in 1985 in Brazil and restricted to South America until uh, 2016 when it moved continents and uh, showed up in Bangladesh. Unlike rice blast, where we have 100, over 100 resistance genes, we're, only find, we're having trouble finding resistance genes in wheat to the blast fungus. We've got one gene that kind of works, but that's it. And fungicides don't work if the environment is right for disease. So this is what I'm talking about. It's, it can surprise you. Uh, what you see here, so if you're um, just sort of glancing at this, you might think this is a maturing wheat field. It's not. So this should be green. These wheat heads just emerged from the boot, and they emerged infected with the blast fungus. So the first report of this disease in Bangladesh uh, resulted in 100% yield losses in lots of fields. So you can see, as far as you can see, this field is blasted and affected about 15% of the total production that year. OK, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start the story, and our uh, next two speakers will continue it. But we're going to talk about how this fungus is exquisitely evolved to infect its host and all of the processes that it goes through. So first, I'm going to tell you that the fungus recruits rice membrane and grows inside a sealed membrane compartment inside rice cells. So this is a hemibiotrophic fungus. It grows first in living rice cells, which it then consumes and eventually kills. But the initial invasion of each cell is a living cell, and it has to be living. The fungus um, produces a specialized interfacial zone, which we call the 
a biotrophic interfacial complex to deliver effectors across the membrane inside rice cells to control the cellular processes. Plant cells are connected by tiny um, channels, communication channels called plasmodesmata. And this fungus has actually learned to use those plasmodesmata to send its uh, effector proteins ahead to prepare neighboring cells before invasion. The major question is how the fungus puts cytoplasmic effectors inside uh, living rice cells. There's a two-step process. So for a long time, we didn't know of any examples where a eukaryotic pathogen has a special secretion system, uh, sort of analogous to the type 3 secretion system in bacteria. But now we know that it is, does have a non-conventional secretion system specifically for these effectors. And um, we think that the rice pathogen co-ops endocytosis to get the effectors on in. Then I'm going to end up talking about wheat blast a little bit, and I'm going to talk about uh, our newly assembled genome for the wheat blast pathogen and what it says about effector gene mobility. Okay, so effectors are basically um, proteins usually, or molecules produced by the pathogen secreted into the plant, um, and um, they, they have two opposite roles. So for the fungus, their role is to promote host susceptibility. They need to do the processes to cause disease. However, a major um, issue in plant disease is understanding the receptors that have um, evolved to recognize pathogen molecules and in doing so um, confer resistance. So effectors have two opposite roles, uh, making disease happen, and also uh, sometimes they, do, they uh, are recognized and cause their own failure. It's important to know where the fungus is inside the rice cell. So here's a little diagram, and this is the rice plasma membrane. Uh, the fungus uh, forms a specialized penetration structure called an apressorium, which you're going to hear a lot more about from Nick in the second talk. Um, the fungus then grows inside the this host cell, so it enters this space inside the, the plant plasma membrane. So the fungus grows while enclosed in an extra invasive hyphal membrane, so it's totally sealed, in fact, inside a membrane as it grows in this cell. So with plant cells, um, they have this huge vacuole, and so we do a process called plasmolysis. So if you incubate the plant tissue in 0.75 molar sucrose, you draw water out of that vacuole and the protoplast sort of shrinks, and you can see where it is relative to the fungus. So the fungus enters into this space, and a neckband-like seal traps uh, apoplastic effectors secreted by the fungus into this uh, compartment, and you'll see more of this in a minute. Okay, here's an image. So what I'm going to show you are images from live cell imaging of rice sheath cells. So what you see here are two rice cells, epidermal cells, and each has been invaded by uh, the fungus. And you see the fungus is expressing green fluorescent protein, so you see these hyphae. And here, uh, the, the cells, the whole system has been treated with FM464, which is an endocytosis tracer dye. And what that shows you is how tightly this fungus is sheathed in this plant membrane. So it's involved, uh, it, it has a process for recruiting plant membranes and wrapping itself in that membrane, uh, presumably to protect it from certain molecules of plants trying to throw at it. Okay, so uh, the other thing, the next thing we discovered when looking at, at this topic is that the fungus differentiates a specialized interfacial zone, which we call the biotrophic interfacial complex, to deliver effectors inside rice cells. Okay, so the other thing we need to know about effectors is 
they come in two classes, depending on where they end up. So here's our apressorium with that first hypha, and apoplastic effectors stay outside the plant cell. So they're trapped in this compartment that the fungus has formed, and they outline the fungus. Whereas cytoplasmic effectors are translocated across that membrane, and they end up inside the host cells. This fungus actually appears to make a lot more, uh, to express a lot more cytoplasmic effectors than apoplastic. So this is what that looks like. So here you see this hypha that's growing, almost filled up this whole cell, and it's expressing an apoplastic effector, which is labeled with a green fluorescent protein, and it's secreted by the fungus, and it's inside that membrane, and you see how nicely it outlines the fungus. However, the cytoplasmic effector, um, PWL2, is secreted into a special structure here, um, which is the BIC. And it's also translocated into the rice cell, which I hope you can see it's actually right there in the rice nucleus as well. So these two classes of effectors have different fates, and they follow different routes to get to their fate. So this summarizes the, the biology of this fungus inside the cell. So here we have the apressorium that penetrates um, through the, the host surface and forms first a typical filamentous hypha. And um, it ha has the BIC at the tip of this hypha. So these, the red indicates cytoplasmic effectors. The blue indicates the host cytoplasm, which bunches around um, the fungal penetration site and, and the BIC. And the green represents the apoplastic effectors. So in order for this to be a successful infection, this hypha differentiates into a different grow growth form, forming these um, bulbous-type cells. Meanwhile, the BIC structure stays behind, beside the first cell it differentiated, and continues to, uh, we think, put cytoplasmic effectors inside. So for successful infection, there's actually three types of hyphae. The primary hypha, um, the bulbous hyphae that grow after, plus the BIC-associated bulbous IH cell. And it's important to differentiate because this cell actually uses a different method for secreting cytoplasmic effectors. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to show you is that the cytoplasmic effectors, once they move inside the infected host cell, actually move through plasmodesmata into all of the neighboring cells to prepare them, probably to turn off host defenses and get any metabolic processes the fungus needs ready for the fungus to go. And uh, I'll show you that here. Okay, again, with plasmolysis, so this is an effector, BAS55. The, the cells with the asterisk here have fungus in them, but the rest of these cells don't have fungus. So this uh, red fluorescent protein here is from the effector that's moved ahead. You see, so even in, in these cells, you see with the fungus still here, it's sending effectors all ahead to prepare the tissue. So this is kind of amazing. If you study plasmodesmata, you know they're extremely sensitive organs. They're communication channels. If they detect there's anything wrong in the cell, they close. And so the fung fungus has actually learned how to manipulate them uh, to keep them open and to send its effectors ahead. Um, here's a different assay we use, another assay where we actually put a nuclear localization signal on the effector, PWL2. Here you see two cells with hyphae growing in them, and it shows very clearly in this PWL2 um, black and white inverse image. So the red here is shown as black and white, and you see that the nuclei of the invaded cells have a lot of effector here, but in every cell that you can see, there is effector that's moved ahead, so they move pretty far ahead. And we have identified over 30 of them that are moving. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know what they're doing yet. Okay, so the last process is how the effectors 
get um, into the cytoplasm uh, first, whoops, how they get into the BIC, and this is, was a fun project that my lab did together with Nick Talbot's lab, where we identified this special secretion system, and then uh, what we're currently working on is how they get across the extra invasive hyphal membrane into the rice cytoplasm. So this was a startling result because fungal um, Golgi are very sensitive to a chem chemical, brafeldin A. And what you see here is that the cytoplasmic effectors are uh, backed up inside the cytoplasm because secretion is totally stopped for the, I'm sorry, I think I said cytoplasm. The apoplastic effectors, the secretion is, is totally stopped, whereas the effectors, the cytoplasmic effectors just keep being secreted. And in fact, you can do uh, photo bleaching, uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching in the presence of BFA, and you st see that uh, the BIC still gets lots of fluorescence recovery. So the, the secretion of these effectors into this BIC region is totally insensitive to this uh, chemical that destroys Golgi. Uh, we do know, we don't know much about this uh, secretion system, but we knew, do know that it requires exosis components, so uh, we can make mutants, knockout mutants of a, a couple of those, SEC5 and, and XO70, and they prefer, preferentially block secretion of the cytoplasmic effectors in the BIC associated cells. So you see that here, uh, and, and the green apoplastic effector is still secreted. So um, I want to point out the two effectors we're working with here, PWL2 and another one, BAS1, biotrophy-associated secreted protein, one which is highly expressed in planta, although we still don't know what it does. Okay, so just to summarize, this cell is really specialized for getting effectors inside the plant cell. So the effectors, of course, were first secreted when it was still a hypha, and then this structure gets left behind as the fungus continues to grow in the cell, and it's secreting effectors um, very efficiently using a Golgi-independent mechanism. Okay, so that's diagrammed here. Um, the cytoplasmic effectors get out into the, the BIC, and our hypothesis now is that they have co-opted the plant's endocytosis system in order to get into the plant cell. And that's based on higher resolution images of the BICs now that we're getting. So again, here is a BIC, but what you see is that there are clear vesicles here. So this is a, a cytoplasmic effector, PWL2 in red, and BAS4 is the apoplastic effector, and you see that the, the PWL2 is clearly in vesicles. Um, you can also detect vesicles inside of the, the host cell, so in the cytoplasm, and they're very dynamic. So I don't have time to go into more detail, uh, our goal now is to actually prove that the fungus is co-opting uh, the plant endocytosis system. We're doing that using um, virus-induced gene silencing, uh, silencing plant endocytosis machinery, and also with chemical inhibitors. And right now, um, we're gathering um, data which shows that uh, our results support a role for clathrin-dependent endocytosis in effector translocation into the host cells, whereas we're not getting any impact for clathrin, for components of clathrin-independent endocytosis. So it all seems to be coming down to the, plant, to the fungus being able to um, manipulate the plant uh, clathrin-dependent endocytosis system to deliver its effectors. Okay, so I want to just summarize. This fungus actually um, delivers hundreds of cytoplasmic effector proteins inside plant cells to cause disease. So it's producing a lot of these. Um, unfortunately for us, we don't know what they're doing because there seems to be a lot of redundancy built into this system. 
So the fungus doesn't have just one effector to do a certain process. Um, it seems to have several because when we knock out individual effectors, we don't see a phenotype. There's no impact on pathogenicity. So the fungus has covered its bases in, in ter terms of redundancy. Um, to summarize, this hyphal dimorphism is really critical and interesting for pathogenicity, and you're going to hear more about the hyphal dimorphism of this um, wonderful structure, the apressorium. The biotrophic interfacial complex is, is critical for getting effectors in and Golgi independent secretion of cytoplasmic effectors. Um, so, so far, cytoplasmic effectors are likely involved in manipulation of plant membranes, of plasmodesmata, and likely of plant endocytosis, in addition to turning off plant defenses, which we haven't talked at, about at all yet. Okay, so this is, this is the fungus. It's highly involved for, for this plant, and um, it's very good at what it does, which is making grass plants sick. So that's the, the positive role. The effectors are involved in, in causing disease, but as I mentioned, the plants have a class of, effect, of receptors which have learned to recognize certain plant molecules. And, uh, and with this recognition, they trigger very powerful hypersensitive resistance response. And you're gonna hear a whole lot more about that from Sophian later. So um, this is what it looks like. Here's a, a particular effector, AVRPETA, which corresponds to a plant uh, resistance gene product, PETA. And if the fungus has the effector and the plant has the resistance gene, this cell that the fungus tries to invade dies. And it's a very effective way to block um, the infection. However, if the fungus loses the ABR gene or the plant doesn't have the R gene, then the fungus is able to grow. So what breeders do is introduce R genes into rice and they break down. As I mentioned, within two to three years, they're not useful anymore because there's a new race of the fungus out that can totally infect that. The breakdown of the resistance genes in the field comes from mutation, mainly deletion, of the AVR PETA gene and the pathogen. So this is one interesting aspect of the system is that for the fungus to overcome resistance genes, the main mutation event for lots of these um, AVR gene, R gene uh, interactions is deletion of the, the AVR gene. And that raises a question of sustainability because if the fungus just keeps deleting these AVR genes, you'd think after a while it would uh, be less aggressive, but that's not the case. Okay, I wanna switch to wheat blast. So rice blast is a persistent problem. I mean, if the weather's right, uh, and there's really not a lot we can do. You can try fungicides, but there's really not a lot you can do. I would say wheat blast is even worse. Wheat blast, blast is looking to be a harder system than rice blast. So wheat blast, it was, as I mentioned, was first identified in 1985 in Brazil. It spread to other countries in South America soon after that, and it jumped to Bangladesh in 2016. This is um, the picture I showed you before, the pictures I showed you before of, of how devastating the disease can be. So this uh, heat map shows wheat production in uh, 2014 million tons, and the darker the green, the, the more wheat, whereas the border, red border shows countries where wheat blast has occurred. So wheat blast has really been devastating wheat production here in South America. Nobody's paid much attention. But there are regions in South America where they don't grow wheat anymore because of this disease. And so it was very shocking when it moved to Bangladesh. And as I said, it, um, it was a, a pretty extensive uh, destruction that was, that was found. And also it's, it recurred the next year and is now well established. So wheat blast is here, which is important for Bangladesh, but it's poised uh, to go 
into India. In fact, it is, scientists believe it is in India, even though the Indian government won't uh, admit that. And of course, China is here too. So wheat blast is on the move, and we've really got to, to figure out how to stop it, because as I said, it's even more difficult to control than rice blast. So this is a picture from last year where uh, wheat blast-like symptoms were identified in fields in India, and the Indian government came in and burned those fields. So here we're talking about smallholder farmers, less than two he hectares, where this really matters, and their fields were being burned. But we believe that, in fact, the disease is established in India, and we need to stop it. Okay, what I'm going to talk to you about is the genomics of the blast fungi really quickly. So uh, we have, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjin Liu, who's an assistant professor at Kansas State University, we now have a genome assembly of a Bolivian uh, wheat blast strain, B71. And I'm going to just describe briefly what that says about effector gene mo mobility in Magnaportha arisei. Okay, we selected B71. I've been working on wheat blast for about nine years in South America, and B71 is the most aggressive uh, wheat uh, pathogen we found. In fact, early indications of resistance that we were identifying is totally over overcome by this strain. So it's highly aggressive. Um, it was isolated in 2012 in Bolivia. And uh, it's actually the closest strain to the Bangladeshi isolates. So we think Bangladeshi isolates were moved from South America and established in Bangladesh. And so this strain is, is very closely related. I want to point out something very interesting. So we've been talking about rice blast. And in this tree that is here, so these are the Magnaportha arisei, arisa pathotype, the subpopulation that's adapted to rice. And you see how uh, there's a lot of isolates here, but there's not much genetic distance. Here is these green are the triticum isolates right here. So what's amazing about the weed blast pathogen is how diverse it is compared to the rice blast pathogen. And I want to point out this, this um, MOL, the Magnaportha rhizae lolium pathotype, became a problem in the US on golf courses. So it gets uh, turf grasses. It's a really serious disease. Started in the late 80s, just like a wheat blast. What we now believe is that the moat population came from the lolium pop population by um, planting of a, a wheat variety that lacked a resistance gene causing uh, lolium isolates that have the corresponding A virulence gene to now be able to infect wheat. So it was a host jump that was mediated by AVR gene, R gene interactions. Okay, I don't have time to talk about details, but we've got a beautiful assembly of the core, the seven core chromosomes here, and we've um, done detailed comparisons with eight of the strains with other, eight other wheat blast pathogens, lolium pathogens, and with other host specificity. What I want to focus on, on here are these scaffolds, uh, one through five, which uh, don't have any correspondence in the rice blast pathogen. These, if you look at the different strains, these scaffolds are highly dynamic. They're clearly dispensable because some, some strains don't have them, and they're highly repetitive. So we thought these might be dispensable mini chromosomes. So mini chromosomes, that's another name for supernumerary chromosomes or B-type chromosomes. So they're chromosomes that are dispensable and sometimes carry important information. I don't know what I did. Sorry about that. Okay, so what we did 
was um, looked at chef gels, and in fact, they do correspond to many chromosomes. So here's an early strain T25 from the 1980s in Brazil. It doesn't have many, uh, many chromosome. B71 has one. And another highly aggressive strain from Paraguay has two many chromosomes. So we've done a lot of analysis, but just to prove this, we recovered DNA from the gels and through whole genome sequencing, uh, lined them to the B71 genome, and here you see the read depth, and you see that the sequences from here correspond to those five scaffolds. An interesting thing was that the two genes that I mentioned to you, PWL2 and BAS1, which are highly expressed effectors in the rice blast fungus, actually reside on the mini chromosome in um, the wheat blast pathogen. So in rice blast pathogens, they're on different chromosomes, they're not linked at all. In the wheat blast pathogen, they're um, closely linked on the mini chromosome and they don't occur on the core chromosomes. So that was a surprising thing. We know that they are expressed on the mini chromosome and they show in plant a, a specific expression. If you look at the mini chromosomes of, of the other strain P, P3, here's the large mini chromosome. It contains the linked PWL2 and BAS1 genes, plus another AVR gene that was, was identified in rice, AVR uh, PIB. Many chromosomes also have various sequences, mostly very sequences from the core chromosomes, particularly the chromosomal ends. So you see here by the read depth that this mini chromosome has picked up some sequences from the end of chromosome three and more sequences from chromosome six and so forth. Here's the second mini chromosome, so it's, it has related sequences, but it's also different. Um, it contains a different AVR gene, one that Sofian's very, uh, ha very excited about, which is AVRPIK. So it's a homologue of AVRPIK, plus it has five novel putative effectors. And it has picked up a section at the end of chromosome seven, which is now duplicated on both the core chromosome and the mini chromosome. Okay, so we've known from rice blast that uh, AVR effectors genes tend to be at the ends of chromosomes. But I would say in this strain, it's really, really even more true because you see here clustered um, AVR genes and effector genes that have been identified in the rice blast pathogen that are in the wheat blast pathogen and that they really tend to map to the ends of chromosomes and on the many chromosomes. Okay, so I wanna just summarize that. I mean, this is, this is work that's brand new and, and will continue in progress. But we think that many chromosomes in the rice blast fungus contribute to a special mechanism to rapidly lose and regain AVR effector genes in response to our gene deployment. So I told you that the most common mutational event is deletion of that AVR gene completely, and we think that many chromosomes are involved in a way to get that, those genes back. So uh, in particular, there's, there's nice work done by my colleague um, Yuki Otosa and his colleagues on a particular AVR gene, AVR PETA, which is highly mobile in Magnaportha rhizae arises strains. In fact, if you look at different strains, it resides near telomeres on chromosomes one, three, five, or seven in different strains. And it's in three different locations on chromosome four, and it's on diverse many chromosomes. And so this is the hypothesis that in fact, these uh, genes are deleted from the genome in strains that need to lose them to grow on their host, but they're not gone from the population and that they can be regained into the population once the negative selection pressure has gone. And we believe that many chromosomes uh, are involved as a reservoir for these genes. And also a, a place where they're gonna be heavily mutated, rearranged, uh, in the case of PWL2 and BAS1 put together uh, for whatever reason. 
So we think this is a fundamental um, new insight onto the biology of the rice blast fungus and why it's been so hard for plant breeders to control. So I just want to thank my colleagues, especially Sanjin Liu, and um, especially Ellie Oliveira Garcia uh, for a lot of the work I talked about, a lot of the new work I talked about today. So thank you. Thank you.